Thank you, Rabbi Levitt. We appreciate you and, and Rabbi Trubaw for making this possible and for your dear friendship and for all of you for being with us today. My mother and sister and I, along with our family, are very grateful. We've learned many things about our father's life after his death. We know he was special, we know we were lucky, and we know he often said how lucky he was. As someone said to us during Shiva, his mindset was unlike anyone else's. It didn't exist in other generations. He was a thriver, not a survivor. I'm going to share some examples of his thoughts. There were a lot of newspaper articles as he spoke for over 30 years on being a Holocaust survivor. Here's a quote. You have a choice to be good people or vicious people, Klein said. It doesn't cost anything to be good people. Six years ago on the, anniversary, on the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, we have a wonderful life, he said, but not a life I would like to recommend my friends to have. Outwardly, we were all happy, but inside of us, we haven't forgotten our loved ones, our parents, mothers, sisters, brothers. Yes, we're living in the great, wonderful country of the United States, but we didn't have an easy life because the pain we have is not something we take an aspirin for. It's something that will be with us until we go into our graves. The next quote is a personal one he said to Audrey and me. For a while now, I've been keeping a journal of conversations that I've had with my parents and medical staff so I could refer to it later. And I'm so glad that I wrote this. On January 17, after our parents were hospitalized with COVID, not because they were very sick, but because their oxygen level could be monitored more closely. His first tearful comments to my sister and I was, I love you with all my heart from the moment you are born until my last day. We quickly explained he was just there to be watched closely and he was not very ill. He immediately changed composure and he said, you think I may leave this place? I never had problems with my oxygen before. Well, that's the way it has to be. Yes, dad, daddy-o, Zaidi, that's the way it has to be. You accepted it with grace and candor in that moment, so much so that it gave us strength. Later that same week, he said he didn't want to be in the hospital for Shabbos. Fortunately, Audrey was able to tell him not to worry. They were going to Menorah Park. He'd be there for Shabbos. Three weeks later, he kept saying he wanted to go home. We thought that meant being moved into a double room to be with our mother. But now we believe his longing for home was to be with his own mother and his dear family in the Shemaim. We take great comfort knowing he got to spend his last day dressed in street clothes with his wife enjoying his Shabbos dinner. He didn't suffer as he passed in this sleep. A few days later, the doctor at his rehab facility mentioned that he himself couldn't sleep when he heard of our father's passing. He was fine, the doctor told us. He just needed oxygen. Well, just like the doctor, we don't know, we don't like it, but as he said, this is the way it's supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you for sharing a little bit of who your father was with us. I'm going to hand things over now to Rabbi Truboff. I think uh, Rabbi Truboff, you should be able to share the screen um, and, uh, and I'll mute myself at this point. So I, I wanna thank Mona for her, her deeply moving words. And, and again, my heart goes out to Mona, Audrey, and Bella and all of Joe's family. Um, when he said those words to you, as you repeated them, I mean, I think a part of me, you know, teared up, if only because um, if you knew Joe, you knew how true they were. Or like that, if, when he said that, that was just the endless. Like that's just what it was. There was nothing, nothing more that could be added to that. And uh, it's just one piece of it made him such a, a special, a special person. So the, uh, the the topic I wanted us uh, to learn a bit about today um, is one that I think Joe 
spent a lot of time thinking about it. I mean, I, I know he spent a lot of time thinking about it because we, we would talk about it. Um, and that is this question about, about suffering and whether or not there is what to be learned from, from suffering. Uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, it's one that we all encounter, but not all of us really ask it or even try to provide an answer for it. Uh, I think Joe's experiences during the show uh, and his attempts afterwards to grapple with it and to speak about it were very much part of a, of a lifelong journey and mission for him to try to make sense of, of what he experienced and try to make sense of all, all that he lost. And he lost, uh, he lost so much. In order to think about this question, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at uh, the writings of a very, very interesting and important Jewish thinker from the Holocaust, uh, and that is the, uh, the Piasetzner Rebbe, uh, Rebbe Kolonimus Kalman Shapira uh, in Warsaw. He was a very important Hasidic Rebbe before World War II, a leader in that community. Uh, and during the invasion of uh, Poland, uh, as the Warsaw Ghetto was being formed, he, his center was in Warsaw, and he became a very important religious and spiritual leader in the ghetto during those, those three years it was, it was in existence. And what's particularly significant about the Piasetzna Rebbe is that he gave drashot, he gave sermons every week and during the holidays, during those very, very difficult and dark, dark years. And the only reason we know this is because he buried the records of his sermons uh, and those records, those, uh, those notes were basically discovered sometime after the war. Uh, and so what they basically recount is the Piasetz no Rebbe's attempt to try to make sense of what the Jewish people are going through, to try to make sense of what his Hasidim are, are going through, the people he, he loves and feels responsible for. And if there's one theme that the sermons, the Drashot, come back to again and again and again, it is this question of, of suffering um, and how overwhelming it is and how profound it is uh, and and as as a rabbi, as a spiritual leader, he he, he wants to try to bring meaning to his to his to to those he loves, uh, and nearly every every drasha struggles with this. And what I want to do is we'll look at a couple of pieces, but particularly one from from Pesach from 1941, uh, and I think it's it, it helps provide insights about what it can mean maybe to learn from from suffering, and particularly how Joe I think you know modeled that uh, in his uh, in in his own life. And again, once we go to this question about can we learn from suffering? Is there a meaning in suffering? As I said, it sort of opens up a Pandora's box. Uh, there's an entire book of the Tanakh, of the Bible, dedicated to it, right? The book of Job. Uh, and every rabbi in his life, right, who deals with people, who tries to be there for people, uh, is going to experience moments in which people are suffering profoundly. And they turn to you and they say, well, what am I supposed to make of this? What's the purpose of this? This is killing me. This is destroying me. And as rabbis, you're always going to have this temptation to provide any answer that may offer comfort. And the problem is too often those answers are superficial or trite or don't speak to the authenticity of, of the reality in, in front of them. Um, and that's basically the message of the book of Job. Job suffers. Job loses his whole family. Job suffers beyond what most of us can imagine. Uh, he does not curse God. He does not turn against God. But at the end of the book, God tells Job, you don't know my ways. You will never understand my ways. Uh, and that is oftentimes the answer that we have to grapple with when it comes to this question of can we, can we learn from suffering? The, the first point I'll just make here is that already from the early year, early months even, of the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, the PSS Nerebi is acknowledging how terrible things are and that there are no simple answers to what people are experiencing. There are no Sukim, there are no teachings that one can run to and just offer, as, as I said, for comfort and, and, and for support. Uh, he already loses his sister-in-law, his son-in-law, um, his, his sister-in-law, daughter-in-law, his own son, and then his mother soon after already, uh, in basically the end of 39, after the, uh, the, uh, the German in invasion. Um, so he is suffering tremendously from the very beginning. And in an early drusha from his time in the ghetto, he talks about two, two Jews, two categories of people, uh, those who are, are lost and those who are cast away, based on a verse from Yeshaya that, that, you, that you all know, because it's actually a, a song that we sing. And when he's talking about Jews that are, that are lost, this is how he describes them. And he's describing people in the ghetto right then and there, right? that they're lost. And that, that sense of being lost reflects something very, very deep about their essence that is now missing. 
he says here, and this is in the, uh, the, the third section here, the, the individual called lost, however, has been destroyed. He is neither discernible nor recognizable. For now the troubles are increasing so greatly. Indeed, they are shaving the beards of Jews so that they cannot be recognized as Jews by their outward appearance. Right? You've all seen those pictures of Nazis, you know, shaving the beards of, of, of religious Jews. And again, it was done to shame them and to, to take away the Jews' identity, right? Their beard is a part of who they are. And to take that away, they look in the mirror suddenly, it's, it's not who they were before. And he continues, furthermore, due to the many persecutions and unbearable, unimaginable torments, people lose their inner identities. This process can go so far, the individual loses himself and doesn't recognize himself. He cannot recall his self-image as it was a year ago on the Shabbat, uh, of even on a weekday before prayer, during prayer, and other such times. Now he's crushed and trampled so much that he cannot discern if he is a Jew, a human being, or rather an animal who does not have the capacity for feeling. He is then lost in the scriptural sense. Uh, so part of what makes this text so, I, I would say, just historically important is that here you have a rabbi from the, the, from the, the, the depths of the Holocaust acknowledging that the suffering that Jews are experiencing is breaking them. Uh, it is literally breaking them. It's destroying their sense of self, uh, and they can't recover it. They can't remember a time uh, before this. Now, at the end of this, this particular sermon, he goes on to say that the lost will ultimately be returned, but what he acknowledges here is something that we don't ever want to acknowledge, which is that sometimes suffering is just too much, right? There's just nothing there other than how it destroys us. And the, and the reason I wanted to bring this first is that when we ask ourselves about whether or not we can learn from suffering, right, it's important to recognize that Pia Setzner Rebbe understands this is not a simple question with a simple answer, right? He knows what suffering does to people. So when he's grappling with this question, he's really trying to grapple with it in a deep way that can be authentic to the reality in front of him. As I, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the sermon I want us to spend a little bit of time on uh, is one from, um, from Pesach, Seventh Day of Pesach, uh, April 18th, 1941, so almost uh, 70 years ago. Uh, and uh, it, it happens that this year in the ghetto, he gives a series of drashot, at least that we have records of, during Passover, during Pesach. And I think that's at least significant because of all the holidays, of all the times of the year on the Jewish calendar, I have to imagine the one that may have been the most difficult in the ghetto uh, was Pesach, right? Because Pesach is the holiday of what? It's the holiday of freedom, right? We, go, we were slaves in Egypt and now we're free, right? So how can that be a holiday that a Jew celebrates in the ghetto uh, when they're being destroyed, when they're, when they're literally slaves? And, and in fact, there's a, a, another rabbi, Rabbi Fahim Oshri, who's a rabbi in, in a different ghetto in Lithuania. He gets asked the question, how can we still say the blessing every morning, thank you God for making me free, when we're not free, when we're still basically enslaved in, in, in a ghetto? Um, Rabbi Oshi has his answer to that. He argues that we're still spiritually free, even if we're not physically free. But you can see how uh, the holiday of Pesach, right, would, would touch a nerve for Jews under these circumstances. And I, I have to imagine that the Piyasat's Rebbe, for him, it was an opportunity to dig even deeper to try to, again, grapple with what people are, are going through. So in this particular sermon um, from the seventh day of, of, of Pesach, uh, he cites a, a very interesting uh, Talmudic teaching as a way of opening up this line of thought about what it means to, to, to understand the, the meaning or the, of, 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 uh, of suffering. Uh, he opens with a, it's a piece from uh, Gemara Masechet Shabbos and it, it says as follows. It says, children came and spoke divulging mysteries, the likes of which were not revealed even in the days of Yeshua ben Nun. And, and what, what he's describing here, what the Gemara is describing here, is that when kids come to learn for the first time, and what they come to learn for the first time is the Hebrew letters. That's why I put a couple on the bottom because we'll, we'll, I'll be referencing them in a moment. But when children come to learn the Hebrew letters, they learn not just the letters themselves, but they have access to something much deeper, much more elevated, much more holy than the letters when they first learn them. And what they learn with those Hebrew letters, as it says here, are, is a revelation higher than that from the days of Yeshua ben Nun, right? Yeshua is the one who follows after Moshe. So the implication here is that the children, when they learn the letters, are experiencing a divine revelation of Torah that's like that of Moshe, right? Because Moshe is who preceded uh, uh, Yeshua. So what does that divine revelation mean? What does it look like when they're learning these letters? What are they, what are they experiencing? What are they gaining from it? So the Gemara goes on. And basically what the, the, the children are doing is as they look at these letters, 
they're discerning unique meaning in them, right? They're seeing meanings in the letters that, that adults wouldn't notice. So he continues here, citing from the Gemara, why does the Hebrew letter Gimel put out its leg toward the Dalet, they ask? The children ask when they first learn the letters. Because Gimel means to give and Dalet means poverty. So the Gimel is giving something to the Dalet. Right, so to understand what's going on here, you have to recognize that the Hebrew letters Gimel, Dalid, right? Gimel sounds like Gomel, right? Like if you're familiar with the phrase Gomel Hasadim, right? To give or to do acts of kindness. And Dalid uh, can also be associated with the Hebrew word Dal, which means poor. So you can read Gimel Dalid as giving to the poor, right? But what the children recognize on top of just the, the, the linguistic association with the letters and how they sound, what words they sound like, is their actual shapes, right? It says here that the gimel is extending its hand out, right? So if you look here at the bottom of the gimel, it's like it's sticking its hand out to the dalid uh, for it to receive something because the dalid is in need. The gimel is basically giving tzedakah to the dalid. Uh, but the gemara goes on. There's one other significant point we can learn from the shape of the dalid. Uh, it says, uh, why then does the dalid turn its head away from the gimel? Because if you look at it, the dalid's facing to the left, right? It's not facing towards the gimel. Uh, and the, uh, the Gemara explains that the reason that Dalit is turned away from the Gimel is because the Dalit is ashamed of having to receive tzedakah, right? People don't want to receive tzedakah. It's embarrassing to be in a position of need, right? They don't want to have to look the Gimel in the eye, right? They don't want to look the giver in the eye. So that's why the Dalit is looking the other way um, so that it can receive without being uh, embarrassed. Um, why does it stick, it stick out its hand behind it? so that the gimel can give without having to look into the face of the recipient. You see the little back part of the dalit here? It's like it's dalit sticking out its hand to receive uh, from the gimel, right? So all these interesting associations that the children are, are learning as they look at these letters and learn these letters uh, for uh, the very first time. Um, and he goes on to, uh, to, to point out, right, the Talmud continues, these children went through the entire Hebrew alphabet revealing many mysteries. Why does the Talmud call them children? Uh, if they were intend, if they were indeed revealing Torah unparalleled even during the days of Yeshua ben Nun. So uh, what, the, what the PSS Nerebi now asks is, and it's a reasonable question, right? How is it that children are able to see all these things that we as adults can't see within the Hebrew letters? How is it that the children can have this almost divine revelation of Torah, like it's Mount Sinai for them, when they're looking at the letters uh, for the first time? All right, the, the thing I'll just point out is that when we as adults look at these letters, we already associate a particular meaning for them, right? Their meaning is essentially one thing and it's closed to us, right? The, we look at the letter and it has the sound, that's it. But when children look at the letters, they basically look at the letters as if they're naked. It's like looking at them for the first time, they don't yet have meaning. And because they don't yet have meaning, right? The children can then see all sorts of meaning um, that nobody else can see. They see the shape of the letters, we as adults, we don't. We just look at the letters and we see a gimel. We don't see the hand. We don't see the face. We don't see uh, any of that. Um, but what the Piyasetz Nerevi wants to try to figure out is what makes children uh, 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 so special that way? And also, uh, why is it that their, their revelation is so e even greater than that which took place in the days of, uh, of Yeshua ben Nun? Uh, so the Piyasetz Nerevi goes on, I'm not gonna read all of this, uh, but what he goes on to point out is a, uh, is a couple of things. He notes that when a Jew studies Torah for the first time, as these children were doing, there is a revelation, a divine revelation, a revelation of Torah that takes place uh, anew every single time. When you learn a new piece of Torah for the first time, right, there's a divine revelation there. When children learn letters for the first time, there's a divine revelation there. And then the PSS Therebi builds this argument for Moshe, because when you look at the Midrashim, when Moshe went up to Har Sinai to receive the Torah, first he received the Torah from God, God taught him the Torah, and then Moshe reviewed it on his own. And what the PSS Nerebi points out is that when Moshe learned the Torah for the first time, that was when the higher level of divine revelation uh, took place. And what the PSS Nerebi's argument is, is that every time we learn something new, there's a divine revelation like Sinai taking place, right? The challenge or what's interesting is that for most of us as adults though, we don't really see the newness of Torah so easily, right? We tend as adults to be locked into a particular way of thinking, a particular way of looking at the world, and we sort of um, already receive things through that lens. As you get older, there's very little 
uh, that becomes new to you. It, there's actually a lot that's new to you, but you don't actually look at it that way. That's, that's the, uh, the problem. But children are different, right? Children look at things with different eyes, which enables them to see that which adults uh, cannot. And that's true even today, right? I, I, I will sometimes teach Torah with my kids, have Torah conversations with my kids, and they recognize things that most adults don't. And it's not because they're smarter than most adults. It's because as you become older in life, right, you learn to sort of shut off um, that innocence and naivete with which you look at things and perhaps see them differently um, um, than others. So the PSS Nerebi goes on here in, in the second paragraph, just to flesh this out, he says, therefore, when a child learns the shapes of the letters, the Hebrew letters for the first time, there is a fresh revelation in heaven concerning these letters. And this fresh revelation occurring in heaven through the child's learning of the letters is drawn downwards. So the child draws down upon himself a fresh revelation as to the meaning of the shape of the letters. This is not the case with adults who are too familiar with the shape of the letters. When we look at them, we're not learning anything new. So we do not have God teaching us directly. Uh, when the Talmud described children, and this is now the important point, why is it that you know, children have this profound ability? What, what can we make of that? Uh, P.S.S. Nerebi goes on to explain that when the Talmud describes children who are able to uh, discern the mystical meaning of the letters, uh, it was actually referring to holy people, the tzaddikim, who can approach the text as children. They brought about revelation even in the shape of the letters and not just in the meaning of the text. Right? Children have this unique ability to see the letters and see what we can't see and bring about a, a divine revelation because of it. As we get older, we lose that ability, but there are some people who retain it, the people that we would call tzaddikim. Right? They have the gift of looking at Torah and being able to see the meaning in it that nobody else can see. Um, and that's a profound gift because if we're not constantly able to see the new meaning that is contained within Torah, then Torah stops being a Torah Chaim. It stops being a living Torah for us. So the people that can do this, um, we need them. We need them desperately because without them, the Torah you know, dies for lack of a better expression. Uh, they're very, very important. And, and clearly what the PSS and Rebbe is, is making connection here to, and he'll, he'll flesh it out a little bit more in just a second, um, is the ability to perhaps see meaning uh, in suffering. That most of us can't do it. Most of us wouldn't even bother to try um, but maybe there's something possible that can be seen there, just as children can see things in the letters um, that most of us uh, uh, cannot. Um, and that's basically the argument uh, that he goes on to make. He says here, and I'll, I'll just read the bolded section. He says, so the suffering God's punishes with uh, is also Torah, right? Not just that we can learn Torah from the text, right? We learn Torah from life. And when we're going through difficult, terrible things, right, that there's a Torah there as well. Um, and he says that if a person can learn something from his suffering, then God could be his Torah teacher for a period of time. Because every time we learn something new, there's a new divine revelation. It's like we're on top of Harsinai with God, like Moshe was receiving, learning the Torah for the first time. So when we can eat, have that ability to discern meaning and suffering, we achieve that. Um, he says, we know that God learns most of all from his students. So there occurs a revelation above and below. Uh, in the fresh revelation, there is a neg negation of hester panim, the hiding of the divine face. So all the judgments are sweetened. That in a moment of profound suffering, you feel as abandoned from God as one could be. You feel as distant from God as one can be. But the ability to perhaps discern some meaning in that experience uh, sweetens the judgment, right? It makes God suddenly a little bit more present within the terrible circumstances uh, that you are ultimately uh, uh, experiencing. Uh, and for the Piasets Nerebi, right, this is the model he's trying to show for his Hasidim, right? He's trying to show them that if we look at this with the right eyes, there is perhaps something there, something that can reclaim this for us so that they don't become, as, as, as he described before, um, lost, completely, completely lost to ourselves and to, and to, and, and to the world. Now, uh, this is a very radical teaching in, in, in a lot of ways. Most of us experience suffering, real suffering, in a way that only brings pain and loss and destruction and, and trauma, right? It's the nature of trauma that you can't attach, you can't attach meaning to it. It defies, it eludes uh, meaning. But there are people, there are tzaddikim, there are rare individuals like those children who can see the meaning uh, where others do not. And again, it's not that the meaning here is de determining God's like plan for the Jewish people, right? It's not that 
we have to figure out our sins so that we can do tshuva so that God will forgive us, right? What's clear here is that it's a meaning that to a certain extent we impose on the reality, right? It's coming from us. That's why God, he says here, when we learn Torah, right? Like God learns from us, right? It's not that there's a, a divine truth in the suffering, like a singular truth that we have to figure out. It's our ability to make meaning from within it that actually um, impacts God, right? It, it's something that we do. It's not something that like we're actually even uh, discerning from within, you know, God's wisdom or anything like that. So the reason that I, I think these ideas are, are, are so important um, is that when I think about what it means to make an attempt to spend one's life committed to this grappling with the meaning of suffering and maybe even being successful at it, I think of Joe. Uh, there's, there's, there's just, no, no question about that. He took his experience in the Holocaust, his experience in the Shoah, and rather than bury it down within himself, right, rather than become lost like so many did, right, he was going to learn from it. He was going to try to understand it. Even if there weren't answers, right, he was still going to try uh, to learn from it, to make some sort of, of meaning from it. Uh, and in many ways, part of the reason I think this is so profound um, and I think it's implicit in the PSS and Rebbe's words too, is that this is what Jews do. Uh, this is how we go about life, right? We go through terrible things, but we do not let that be the end of the, of the story. And if we think about Pesach itself, right, the whole holiday of Pesach, and especially the way we celebrate it at the Seder, is constructed in a fashion in which we are not trying to ignore our pain, that we're actually on some level trying to relive it and try to recognize the lessons that we, can, that we can learn from it, that we can actually learn from the pain and suffering that we've experienced as a people. And, and I wanna just offer three citations from the Haggadah um, that for me at least capture ways in which uh, Joe was able to, to, to learn from the, the suffering that, that he experienced. And these are sections we're all familiar with, but like a lot of things, we, we, like, those, like the Hebrew letters, we look at them, we don't always realize all the meaning that's contained with them, within them. Um, so the first section here is, is from Halach Ma'anya, right, the very opening of the Magid section. Halach Ma'anya diachalu avahatana ba'ar de Mitzrayim, right? We hold up the matzah and we say, this is the bread of affliction our ancestors ate in Egypt. Uh, let all who are hungry come and eat. Let all who are in need come and share the Pesach meal. This year we are still here. We're still in exile. Next year in the land of Israel. This year we're still slaves. Next year we are free. So to understand what's going on here, right, the first thing we have to recognize is that the matzah, what we normally associate it with our freedom, with our redemption, right, here we're calling the matzah uh, the bread of affliction, right? We have to understand why that is. Why is the matzah the bread of affliction if it's supposed to be associated with freedom? And the reality is that matzah has a, a dual meaning to it, right? It is both the bread of freedom, the bread of redemption, but it is also the bread of slavery, the bread, bread of, of affliction and, and suffering. Now, you know, the commentators on the Haggadah, like they'll point out that, you know, matzah is the bread of affliction uh, because when you eat it, it affects your, you know, intestines, right? It's hard to digest, right? So a little tongue in cheek, but the primary understanding seems to be that the reason the matzah is the bread of affliction is that we also ate matzah not when we were going free from Egypt or not just when we were going free from Egypt, but also when we were slaves because matzah is slave bread. It only has two ingredients, flour and water. It takes a very short time to cook. So slaves who have no time, have no energy, can basically make it and eat it, right? So matzah is the bread we ate when we were slaves. And it's also the bread that we ate when we were free. Uh, and that is very, very significant. Because if we remember matzah is the bread that we ate as slaves and as we are free, that means there's a very important lesson to be learned there, which is the very next part of the, the Haggadah, right? Let all who are hungry come and eat. Right, because if you remember your affliction, if you remember your pain, you remember your suffering, right, there's a lesson to be learned from it, which is that when you actually have a home, when you actually are free, right, you need to turn yourself towards others, right? You need to open your doors to your homes and welcome people in, right? That suffering should open us up. It should not close us off, right? That is a fundamental message of the Haggadah and, and Pesach as, as, as a whole. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that we read this line. Right, and some of the medieval commentators were saying, you gotta open the door. You should say it so that everybody who's outside and in need can come inside and they, and they can eat. Um, we don't do that, most of us. Most of us don't even invite strangers or, or potential guests into our home or people in, in need. Right, so I'd say a lot of us, and I'll, I'll put myself in there as well, right, this is a hard lesson to learn, that from the Jewish people's collective memory of suffering, we're supposed to learn to open our homes up on Pesach, right? 
not just when it's convenient to us to open our homes, but on the holiday when we like to be with our family and friends. Here we're saying, no, 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 you were slaves. You suffered. You got to open your door. You got to remember what that's ultimately uh, about. And again, one of Joe's great, great gifts is the way he just could open his hearts to others. Uh, and it was just so authentic and so genuine. And it was everybody he met, whether it was at the shul, whether it was other Holocaust survivors, whether it was people in, in his work. I mean, he would tell me all the time stories about, you know, people he would work at the different, you know, clients and the properties that he managed and his coworkers. And I mean, it, Joe had relationships everywhere. Um, and he carried his suffering with him uh, at all times, right? If you knew Joe, you knew he suffered from anxiety. You know, he suffered from, from PTSD to a certain extent, but it never caused him to be closed off or to pull in. It always enabled him uh, to be open to others because he carried that memory of affliction with him. It, he, it, it, the Torah says we're supposed to love the stranger because we remember we were the stranger, right? Very few Jews live up to that. Joe did, and it was, his, it was him. It was his story. Um, the other dimension of this, I think, that is, that is so, so important um, is, the, is the last part, which says, now we are slaves, next year we are free, now we're in exile, next year in Israel. And one of the other things I loved about Joe was his recognition that we are always on the move, that we're always trying to push um, to go farther, right? It, Joe was never one who was happy just to settle and stop. He always recognized that there was more to be done, more that could be achieved. I mean, certainly with the shul, you know, by the time um, I was there, right, Joe was obviously a bit older then, um, but he was not going to stop doing everything he could. And more importantly, he recognized the shul wasn't where it needed to be yet. And he was going to keep pushing and pushing and doing whatever he could uh, to, make that, um, uh, to make that happen. And that ability to recognize that you're not there yet um, is also a rare ability. Um, and one that, that Joe had, and, 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 and it was a very important lesson um, to be able to, to learn that from him. Uh, the next major piece of the Haggadah that I think Joe very much embodied, um, and that is the, the four sons, right? We know that we say in the Haggadah that we're going to tell the story of the Exodus to the next generation. And the Haggadah says that there's four sons, right? Four different types of people that we got to tell the story to, and each one we have to tell uh, in, their, in their own way. Everybody has got to sort of hear the story in the way that they, that the way that they can, can hear it. Now, if we think about the four sons, there's the wise son, the wicked son, the simple son, and the son who doesn't know how to ask. Now, what I will say is for Joe, obviously the story that he knew needed to be told was the story of, of the Holocaust, the story of Jewish suffering during, during World War II. Um, and that was not an easy story to tell. And when you looked out at the Jewish community and the non-Jewish community, uh, it wasn't so clear that people wanted to hear it. And even of those who maybe wanted to hear it, it wasn't so clear how to tell the story in a way that they could. Right? On a very simple level, there were no wise children after the Holocaust, meaning there were no American Jews or American non-Jews who already understood the story. That's the wise child's ability. They know the story. You just got to give it to them a little bit more in depth. There were no wise sons after, after the Holocaust because nobody could, who, was, who wasn't there could understand or really appreciate what had taken place. There were no small number of wicked sons, wicked children, who basically didn't want to have anything to do with the story, who denied it, right? They existed before and they still very much exist now. They, they didn't believe it happened. They had no interest in hearing about it. There were simple sons, simple children, who maybe knew a little bit about the Holocaust, um, but not much, um, and needed to obviously learn more. But it's the fourth son here, which I think is the most important, and the one that Joe understood the most, is that most Jews and most Jews, non-Jews after the Holocaust, they were the son who doesn't know how to ask. They didn't know about the Holocaust and they were afraid to know about the Holocaust. And they didn't even know where to begin to learn about the Holocaust. And what the Haggadah teaches us for those children, which was most of us, most of the Jewish world, it says, Atpetachlo, you got to begin for him. You got to start for them. You can't wait for them to come and ask you a question because they don't even know how to ask. Who knew in you know, the 50s and 60s and 70s how to ask questions about the Holocaust to survivors, right? You got to start for them. And the truth is most Holocaust survivors couldn't do this. They couldn't take that initiatory step of, of telling their story for the other. Um, it was too much. But Joe understood that if you're going to tell this story, you can't wait for people to ask. You got to start for them. Uh, and that's why he put himself out there in so many situations um, to tell his story. And of course, as we know, it wasn't just his story. It was the story of his, his family, his siblings, his friends, uh, and, and ultimately the six million uh, who, who, who perished. 
Uh, but he knew if you didn't get that story out there first, if you didn't start for them, right, they were never ultimately going to hear it. And I, I don't even know how many thousands of people heard Joe's story. I mean, I, maybe it's tens of thousands. I mean, it could easily be that. I mean, he spoke in so many places to so many people. And as you all know, I mean, if you heard him come back from one of those sessions, he would tell you all these stories about how they heard it and what they related to and what was important, so important for them. I mean, every time he told it, uh, it, it was like he was telling it for the first time. And it was certainly for them, the people hearing it for the first time. Um, and he could see there was like a revelation that took place for them, right? When he was able to tell that story for them. They didn't know how to ask the question, but he started from them um, and they learned so, so, so much from it. Um, the last point of the Haggadah that I want to make mention in reference to Joe um, is what we say towards the end of the Magid section. Behold, over door, Hayavadam, the Rotat Tatsmo, Ki'ilu, Hu Yatsam, Mitzrayim. Right? Then every generation, one is obligated to see themselves as if they went out of Egypt. Um, and you tell your son on that day about it. Right? That even if we weren't there in Egypt, right, we have to see ourselves as if we were slaves and went out and became free. And not only do we have to see ourselves that way, we have to tell that story uh, to our children, right? This really emphasizes this notion that the story of the Exodus has to be told, has to be told by every generation. Without it, Jews won't continue. We know that. So the Exodus is too foundational for this story not to be passed down. Now, what Joe also understood is that it's not just the story of the Exodus that is like that, right? The story of the Holocaust is also like that that every generation has to hear this story. And what's particularly important, especially, unfortunately, as Holocaust survivors pass away, is that those who weren't there are gonna have to be able to tell this story as well. Just as was the case, has been the case for the Exodus throughout Jewish history. Parents weren't there, but they still told their, son, their children the story of the Exodus. So too, many of us were not there during the Holocaust, but we're gonna have to find a way to tell that story um, to the next generation. We have a chiyuv, right? We have an obligation uh, to do that, if only because the Holocaust is an event that stands apart in Jewish history, and we know this. It's not just another Jewish tragedy. Um, it's something whose lessons have to be passed down. Um, and um, in order to do that, every generation has to see itself as obligated. And one thing I'll point out that we learned from, the, from Pesach and from the Seder is, you know, again, you could ask yourself, how can we do this? How can I tell a story that I wasn't there for? But the reality is, if you hear the story being told by people who were, uh, it can become your own story. And it often becomes your story when you have to tell it to others. Right? The act of telling somebody else's story to another person, it becomes your story. You can't tell a story unless you can on some level see yourself there. Um, and that is the power of stories. We can hear them and imagine ourselves there. And I, I, I know this was true for my, my, my grandfather was not a Holocaust survivor, but he fought in World War II and he was in the, he, liberated Madhausen with his unit. He was stationed at Madhausen. He had many stories about talking with survivors at Madhausen. My grandfather spoke Yiddish, so he could, he could converse with them. Uh, and it was, it was, I wasn't there, but those stories are in my mind. And, and the same thing is true with Joe's stories for me. Uh, and I'm sure it's true for all of you. You know, I have those images. For me, the, I, I wrote about this after Joe passed away, that image of the line um, at Auschwitz with Mengele. Like, I, I just feel like I was there. Like, I, you know, when he would, Joe would go with the, you know, like this or the this, and, and I, I feel like I was there. And um, that's what it means to really hear these stories of survivors and recognize that if we really hear them, we can tell them and we have to tell them, right? That's the message of the Haggadah. And that's the message that I think Joe understood um, without question, that this story has to be told and it's going to ha keep having to be, uh, to be told going forward. Um, the last point I want to make um, um, about Joe, and especially how we remember Joe and think about Joe going forward, um, is based on a, a, a midrash. Uh, a midrash that connects us uh, to Joe's forebearer, to Yosef. Um, Yosef <laughs> that same name, obviously, right? Uh, Yosef plays a unique role in the context of the Exodus story, right? Yosef is sold into slavery, but Yosef is the one who saves Egypt from famine, right? And Yosef's basically there, right? He's the one who gets the Jewish people through what they need to, uh, uh, to get through. Um, and what's very interesting is that before Yosef dies, he makes sure his descendants promise that Yosef will be buried in Israel. For the time being, he's buried in Egypt, but he knows the Jews are gonna go free and he wants to be buried in Israel. His father went back to Israel to be buried, but Yosef is gonna let himself be buried in Egypt with his descendants. He's not gonna leave them. He's gonna be there for those hundreds of years that they are in slavery. And the Midrash points out that before Moses takes the Jewish people out of Egypt, right, he has to fulfill this promise that Yosef uh, made his descendants uh, make, 
Um, so Moshe has to find Yosef's bones. He has to find his remains. Um, and it's not so easy to do. Yosef's been buried for hundreds of years. Uh, he doesn't exactly know where it is. And there's Midrashim about how Moshe is sort of able to miraculously find them. With the point being that Yosef's got to go free too. Um, and what's very interesting is that Midrash takes this idea to, a, to another level um, in that it says that when the Jewish people marched through the desert after they were free, right, they carried two Aronot, right, two, um, um, there's no good translation for Aron, right, there was the Aron Kodesh, right, the, uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, and there was the Aron, the, the coffin, the casket of Yosef. The both, each Aron marched together in the desert with the Jewish people, and they marched side by side, which is a very profound image, right, this, the Ark of the Covenant, right, the sign of God, God's promise, right, the Torah on the one side, and on the other side, you have Yosef's remains, Yosef's bones. Uh, and it's a very, very striking image that the, uh, that the Midrash um, describes with that. And Emmanuel Levinas, great French uh, philosopher, Jewish philosopher, who himself had spent time in the camps during, the, during World War II, he has a, an interesting take on this Midrash that I think is very important and very important for how we think about, about our, our own Yosef. Um, what he's noting here in this piece, it's just a short excerpt from a larger essay, he makes the argument that in modernity, right, it's continually assumed that um, Jews are going to disappear, right? The, the nature of Jews in modernity is mostly to assimilate. We know this, unfortunately, right? That's kind of what happens again and again, every generation in the last couple hundred years. When Jews have a choice, they tend to choose to leave Judaism. Um, and what Levinas argues is that to the extent that Judaism has continuity, it is to a certain extent dependent on um, those who are willing to keep the Torah fully, um, that they are to a certain extent the guarantee of, of Jewish continuity uh, uh, going forward. Um, and again, we could debate whether that statement's true or not. I think there's a truth to it um, and enough for us to think through what that might um, uh, mean. Um, and here he describes this image of the two Arons, uh, Yosef's bones and the Arona Kodesh, um, side by side, uh, as a reflection of this idea that we, that we without, or without like a, a, a true proud, profound commitment to Torah, right, the Jewish people aren't going to survive. He says, across the desert, what Midrash tells us, the Israelis coming out of Egypt uh, carried the remains, sorry, the remains of Joseph in an ark alongside the ark of him who lives eternity, right, two arks, side by side. Passersby were astonished. What did these two arcs in the desert signify? People see this procession. It's a very strange procession. You got a coffin and you got the Ark of the Covenant. Coffin, assumingly, is pretty simple, you know, wood, whatever. And the Ark of the Covenant is gold with everything that accompanies it. They were told, the people who saw this side and asked, what's going on here? Right? This one is the coffin of a dead man, right? Pointing to Yosef's bones. And that one is the Ark of him who lives eternally, right? But again, there's a bit of a paradox here. God is Chayel Amim. God is everlasting life, and you have side by side Yosef's bones symbolizing death, right? As Jews, we don't usually put death at the forefront of things. So what happens next? Then the passersby, like people today, asked, what is the coffin of a dead man doing beside the ark of him who lives eternally? Uh, and this is the reply the Midrash says. The reply was, he who lies in the coffin of the dead man has accomplished all that is written on the tablets lying in the ark of him who lives eternally. Have you understood what that means? The living God can be found among this free people in the desert only if the memory of him who has rigorously obeyed marches alongside. All right, so Levinas's point is, you don't have the Torah, you don't have God's presence amongst the Jewish people unless you've got Yosef's bones alongside of it, right? That Yosef and all the sacrifices that he made, and they were many, right? He is the fulfillment of the Torah. He is the guarantee of the Torah. And without him, the Torah doesn't have uh, a future. So I, I want to flesh this idea a bit out because I do think it's, it, it's very powerful, at least, at least for me. Uh, and the first way I want to flesh it out um, is from a story, a story of a Holocaust survivor from Munkash, uh, where Joe is from. Um, not Joe, uh, but Chazen uh, Moshe Kraus. Um, Chazen Kraus uh, came to our shul several years ago. Uh, and he told the story, and I'll never forget it, partially because also my, my grandmother was born in Munkash. So anything with Munkash, I tend to listen very closely to. So Chazen Kraus talked about a story of a few Jews who were traveling from Munkash um, to a nearby city. Um, and as they were traveling on the journey, 
they came to an intersection, um, but they weren't sure where to go. Because the problem was the sign that would have been standing up and pointing, okay, it's this way to the town that they're going to, had fallen down. Um, and as long as it had fallen down, they didn't know which path they were supposed to go on. So Chazen Kraus says, well, what do you do in this kind of situation? What do you learn from it? So what the Jews realize is, ah, we have a solution, right? Because the sign actually has two directions. It has one direction that points towards Munkash and the other direction that points to where they need to go. So as long as they pick up the sign and orient the arrow towards Munkash, the other arrow of the sign will point them which way the path that they're supposed to go. Uh, and what Chazen Kraus said from this, which was you know, so simple and so elegant yet so true, um, is something very basic. If you know where you've been, you know where you need to go, right? If you know the path that you've been walking on, the path that your parents, grandparents came from, um, you know where you need to go, right? That gives you the direction ultimately where you need to go, even when you come to crossroads. Um, and there's something very true about that in this Midrash, right? Yosef's bones needed to be there because it was a reminder of where the Jewish people had been. And they needed that reminder of the past with them because without it, they weren't really going to know uh, where, they needed to, uh, where they needed to go. Um, and again, it, it's worthwhile to recognize who Yosef was because the similarities between him and, and Joe are, again, uh, more similar than you might think. Um, who was Yosef? Like Joe, he was a stranger in a strange land. Right? Yosef went down to Egypt. He did not know Egypt. He was not an Egyptian. Right? Uh, he spent, Yosef spent much of his life separated from his family. Right? Joe was a stranger in a strange land. In, in Israel, in America, uh, it, he spent most of his life feeling like a, a foreigner, like Yosef did. Um, but like Yosef, both Yosef and Joe, in this new land, this strange land, this difficult place, they built up uh, their lives again. Um, Yosef suffered too. Um, Yosef suffered in ways that we always, we can't necessarily imagine. He was betrayed by his brothers. Uh, his brothers brutalized him, really. They sold him into slavery. Even when he emerged to a position of prominence in the house of Potiphar, right, he was eventually sent to jail uh, because of Potiphar's wife's accusations against him, right? So Yosef suffered tremendously throughout his life, and he made sacrifices, many sacrifices, um, for the Jewish people, for his family. Um, why did he do this? Um, because he understood ultimately the sacrifices were necessary uh, for um, uh, 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 the future, right? Yosef's bones, which are the, uh, the memory of his life, right? They reflect the sacrifices that Yosef made. Um, and they're also what make Torah possible, right? They're what make a Jewish life possible. That's why we need that reminder out there for us, for the Jews as they're marching uh, through the desert. Um, and Joe was no, it was no different. I mean, we know how much he suffered. We know how much it hurt him to be separated from his family. We know how much he carried that suffering with, with him, right? Yosef doesn't forget the pain his brothers did to him, right? When their father dies, the brothers are afraid Yosef's going to be angry with him right? and maybe even try to kill them now because their father's not around, right? They know Yosef is carrying the pain. But what does Yosef tell his brothers? He says in a very profound statement, um, he says, you don't need to be, I, I, he essentially implies, I'm still angry. What you did to me was horrible, but it was also all part of God's plan. Um, it was all necessary on some level. Um, Yosef, only Yosef can say that. We can't say that about Yosef's circumstances. The brothers can't say that. Only Yosef um, can say that, but he does. He's able in his own life to find meaning uh, in the profound suffering uh, that he experiences. Um, I think Joe is very much the same way. And both Joe and both Yosef, um, understood um, that to be a Jew means carrying the past with you, all of the past, even the parts of it we find difficult uh, and painful uh, and uncomfortable. And if you can't do this, if you can't carry that painful past with you, um, I'm not sure you can be do Jewish because on a certain level, one is the condition for the other. Being a Jew is this very strange condition, I like to say sometimes. Uh, it means looking backwards to the past as you walk forwards to the future, meaning it's kind of a strange sight. You're kind of like walking backwards as a Jew in life. That's what it means to be a Jew. But it's really no more strange than carrying the Aaron of the living God, the Ark of the living God, and the Ark of jo Yosef's bones um, side by side. And, and for me, uh, and I have no doubt this is the case for Joe's family, um, and for Cedar Sinai Synagogue, and for Warrensville, and all the survivors who knew Joe, um, you know, Joe was our... Joe was our Yosef. You know, he lost his family. He made sacrifices. 
I can tell you our shul wouldn't be here without Joe, like Yosef. Um, just as the Jewish people had the great responsibility to carry Yosef's ark, Yosef's Aaron, all of, the peop- all of us here have a responsibility to carry Joe's Aaron with us uh, into the future. Um, that past that he bore, right, the past that most people wanted to forget, we have to carry it with us and we have to learn the lessons from it just as Joe did. And we couldn't do it on our own, right? Like we needed um, the tzaddikim, as the PSS Narbi says, who can see what's there, to see what, what looks to us like a black hole, right? Joe, we need people like Joe to see that there is meaning in there. There is what to be learned and what to be carried forward. Um, Cedar Sinai Synagogue, right? The synagogue, the community he loves so much has a responsibility to carry Joe's, Joe's our own. Um, Joe's family has a responsibility to carry Joe's our own. And we should know that when we carry Joe's our own into the future, we're not just carrying him, but we're carrying the memory of the, uh, the six million who perished as well. And we have to recognize that only if we can do this, only if we can carry that difficult, painful past with us, um, can our future, all our futures, uh, be insured. Uh, may Joe's memory for all, forever be a blessing. Man. I had planned to, to also share some sources from uh, another seminal th- Jewish thinker of the 20th century, Eliezer Berkowitz, who was born in Romania, educated in, uh, in Berlin. He had smicha from the Hildesheimer Seminary and then uh, fled, fled Berlin just after Kristallnacht uh, and ended up in England, Australia, and eventually made it to the US and then made Aliyah in the 60s. And Berkowitz was really the, Rabbi Berkowitz, Rabbi Berkowitz was really the first uh, Orthodox thinker to deal in a very, I think, explicit way with trying to make sense of the, the Shoah, that he wrote a book called Faith After the Holocaust in the 1970s. But even before that, in, in one of his first major works that he wrote in English, uh, a book called God, Man, and History that he wrote in the, in the 50s, you can see that he is writing uh, in the, very much in the shadow of the Holocaust. And even though that he escaped its worst horrors, he fled Nazi Germany in 1938, he's very much grappling with the question of, of how this could have happened and looking back at a world that he knew that is now totally destroyed. And many of the themes that he discusses are ones that Rabbi Trubov met, mentioned, Levinas and the Esh Kodesh, this idea that the Holocaust is a time, and all tragedy is a time of Hester Panim, when God is, he says, not distant, but hidden. It's a very profound statement of faith that, it's, that, it, that I, is really worth reflecting on, that sense that God could be near, even in tragedy, even though we may not see him. His sense also, Berkowitz writes about the key a- aspect of Judaism is responsibility. That that's the whole idea of mitzvah of being commanded is that we have a responsibility in this world. I think when I think of Joe, as I, as I knew him over the last few years, that he very much lived a life full with responsibility. And in terms of his the education he did in the community, teaching the lessons of the Holocaust to, to, to the next generation, his feeling of responsibility for the shul, he was imbued with a sense of responsibility. It's also incredible just looking around at everyone who's here today, how many people he touched at every point in his life, people who knew him 70 years ago and people who feel just as connected and just as deeply impacted by who he was and only got to know him over the last few years towards the end of his life. I just wanna uh, read one part of a teaching that, that Berkowitz wrote, just to finish on, that Berkowitz writes in God, Man, History, that as much as God gives us, response, gives us freedom to make choices, gives humanity freedom to make choices, because that is the essence of our responsibility. There's no responsibility, he says, without freedom. God, he says, alone, who determined the beginning will determine the end. Having granted man the freedom to fail, God will not let him fail irrevocably. The divine responsibility for creation is the guarantee that the purpose of man's formation and freedom and and responsibility will not ultimately be thwarted. That is the root of the messianic faith. That as much as God gives us freedom and responsibility, we also believe that ultimately God's plan and vision will be realized. And I think something else that was truly incredible about Joe was his optimism, 
and I remember mo both Mona and Audrey, you shared with me be before the funeral, that Jill often said how much he deeply believed people were good, which is just an incredible testament to who he was and to, uh, to his vision. And I think just to make that, that comparison to Yosef, Rabbi Truboff, that you made as well, is that Yosef also, despite what he sees is going to happen to the Jewish people in Mitzrayim, knows redemption will come. Right? He, he doesn't want to be left behind because he knows there will be a point when his descendants leave. So may we all carry with us Joe's sense of responsibility for the Jewish people, for his community, and also his optimism about humanity. And may his memory be a blessing. I'm going to uh, end the recording now and go ahead and unmute people. Um, if people want to sh uh, share some words, it can be a little bit hard over Zoom, but uh, I think it's easy to just say hello and, uh, and, uh, and just greet one another.